Oh yeah, right. Thank you. 
next speaker and come in. No, you can just you can just wrap it up and then all the we're good. Uh, do you have a Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to our celebration of life for my father, Fred Walker. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, on behalf of uh, the family, um, I'd like to kind of get things started. We've got a, a, a quite a number of people that would like to share a few memories, maybe a few stories and embellishments. Um, but I'm gonna go off script just for a moment because as I look at all these faces in the room, I think I need to make sure that everybody has a certain expectation. I may look like my father. I do have his genes. I do not have his skill set at storytelling. I do not have his comfort and ease at public speaking. I do not do banter well with hecklers. Dan Bennett, I'm talking to you, wherever you are. Yeah, there you are. Keep the heckling to a minimum. Dad may have enjoyed it. It's not good for me. <laughs> so I'm gonna get the ball started with um, 
sharing a memory from my childhood. So I'm an only child. And much to my dad's chagrin at the time that I was born, you know, I think he was hoping for a son. Um, don't misunderstand. I was daddy's little girl. There's no question about that. And he showered me in love and affection and everything. Um, but being the sports enthusiast that he was, he was looking for a son to play catch with. So my dad, the eternal optimist, he uh, decided that, well, we're going to have to work with what we've got. So began the afternoons of learning how to throw a ball in the backyard. Let's just say he's a patient individual. We know that. We've all experienced his patience. And he was, he was a wonderful instructor. He taught me the motions, transferring the weight, release of the ball, instructing me all on the proper technique. So I let it rip. First thing out of his mouth, you throw like a girl. <laughs> Needless to say, my six-year-old self was highly insulted, hands on the hip, and said, of course I'm a girl. So I went on at that, opp had that opportune moment to say, I knew you always wanted a son. He quickly dismissed that and cleared the air to say, I don't want a son, I just want a ball player. <laughs> so the lessons continued. So we, uh, we then went on to learn how to catch. I seemed to have quite a bit of an aptitude for that. Things were going really well, but then both of us were a little overconfident and I got beamed in the head. First thing out of dad's mouth, don't tell your mother. Then quickly followed, oh, are you okay? Yes. Uh, so that was the beginning of many enjoyable years of me playing catch with my dad. Uh, you could always count on dad to have uh, a pack of mitts and a ball in the trunk of his car. So there was plenty of afternoons in any sort of open space we could find or the backyard. Um, and uh, I also had the, the, the privilege and uh, pleasure of joining the CBC softball team on occasion. So my dad's love of ball started when he was young and he kept it all through till the day that the doctor said that you're not allowed to play ball anymore. And he was aghast. It was like, what do you mean? And it was like, hmm, those knees, they're not going to carry you around the bases anymore. So, you know, he was regulated to just doing his play-by-play -play for the Blue Jays in the den. <laughs> so at, uh, as I, I reminisce about my childhood and not being the boy that he wanted, I'd like to bring up my cousin, Greg, who is the son of his heart, who would like to share a few words with you. So my name's Greg Walker. Um, Fred's uh, brother, John, uh, was my father, so I'm, I'm Fred's nephew. Um, Christine and Wendy, uh, keeping with the sports theme, uh, asked me to bat lead off. And while I'm not as quick these days about uh, uh, getting down to first base for a bunt single, I uh, can usually be counted on for a line drive that occasionally falls in for a hit or two. Anyway, I just wanted to share a couple of vignettes of my own memories of Fred, uh, who we're all going to miss terribly. Some people aren't fortunate enough to have even one true father figure in their young lives and those important formative years. I've been lucky enough to have three. My dad, my stepfather Alan, and Uncle Fred. I was so lucky to have Fred as a constant in my life growing up, especially after my parents' divorce and my dad moving out west to Edmonton and then Vancouver, and after that, dad and I didn't see each other very often. But for most of my life, Fred was usually nearby. I have dad and Fred's uh, side of the family to thank for a ra radio-ready voice, as I was told on many a conference call in my career. I was always proud to say how I, I came by it honestly with Fred's many years at the CBC. Unfortunately, I missed out on the height genes. Um, I got my mom's side of the family uh, mostly there, unfortunately. 
uh, maybe we met in the middle. But it wasn't just the, uh, the familial connection between Fred and I. Uh, we, we both had a, a shared love of gadgets, computers, um, digital photography, and not to mention sports. I'll never forget being about 12 years old and Fred showing off his new Intellivision gaming console. What fun it was to play sports as a video game on your TV. And that kind of shared love of gadgets, sports, and photography continued into my 20s when Fred got me a gig shooting an international squash match in Toronto uh, from behind the front wall glass with my very first digital camera. Flash forward over 20 years, and I was uh, often called by Fred for some kind of tech support. I had a career in, in IT. So whether it was the uh, uh, Amazon Alexas and the related heart smart home stuff that I uh, kind of got him into and now is trying to get uh, Wendy out of. Uh, <laughs> or the usual uh, internet, uh, Mac and PC issues. Uh, I would uh, be helping him out. Uh, and I could always picture Wendy rolling her eyes and insistently whispering to Fred, Leave me, leave Greg alone with all his, all your techie stuff, all your questions. But uh, truth be told, I was more than happy to get those calls and to be able to help out. Um, because it always gave us an excuse to come visit. We only lived a few kilometers away, so any time you have t a chance to spend time with family is, is welcome. Anyway, when, when uh, we'd get there, Fred and I would spend as much time talking about the, the Blue Jays or Maple Leafs or the latest tennis or golf match uh, going on um, as about the tech, techie, techie stuff that uh, ostensibly had uh, been the reason for me to come over and, and uh, you know, Laura and Wendy, uh, my, my wife Laura sitting over here, um, they would talk about everything else and I'm sure uh, uh, they solved the issues of uh, world hunger and uh, Mid Middle East peace uh, at least two or three times over during those, those times. I could also spend a long time recounting how uh, Fred's MC abilities repeatedly made such a great contribution to charities like the Peel Children's Center or interviewing uh, one of my other childhood hi heroes, Terry Fox, during his famous Marathon of Hope. Uh, there is an archive of that, uh, uh, that, that interview on the CBC website, so be sure to uh, reminisce by, by searching that out. And uh, um, Christine, you've done a great job uh, so far in uh, inheriting those abilities as, as MC. But let's go back in time. Dateline, September 5th, 1972. The Munich Massacre at the Olympics was to become a global story. Fred and a colleague were aware of the events while they were unfolding. He was there. And he was desperately trying to get the story back to Canada. But it was the middle of the night in Toronto and Montreal. And they couldn't reach anyone. They couldn't uh, get uh, people to uh, answer their pager or their Blackberry. Those hadn't been invented yet. Uh, this was long before the 24 by 7 uh, news cycle and the internet that we now uh, associate with, uh, with sports and, and news in general. So despite uh, Fred's uh, collection of uh, audio equipment and his, his love of technology, he was a man well ahead of his time, let's just say. Speaking of which, if there's anybody who needs an audio cable ever invented, line forms to the left over here, all right? I was never particularly starstruck uh, by uh, sports celebrities or Fred's familiarity with them, but he certainly could spin a few tales out of school to family. But that said, there was one time when Jerry Howarth, the uh, longtime voice of the Toronto Blue Jays on radio, invited Fred to use uh, a pair of tickets in the stands at the Sky Dome. I don't really know what they officially call it these days, but I still call it the Sky Dome. Um, and I got to be his plus one that day. So uh, around the fourth inning or so, we went up to the broadcast booth for an inning or so with Jerry, uh, Alan Ashby, and Mike Wilner. 
and although I never got to be in the booth when uh, Fred was af actively broadcasting to see him in action, it was a real treat to see what it's like during a live pro sports broadcast, so that was fun. But one last memory. I don't recall which event it was related to, whether it was Commonwealth Games or Olympics or whatever, um, but uh, we were having dinner over at um, uh, uh, Wendy and Fred's uh, place, and Fred got a, a phone call. It was Mark Tewksbury calling to let Fred know that he had won an event and, if I recall correctly, set a new Canadian record in the backstroke. The details of which event it was or, or anything are not what's important here. What I remember most is how much respect Fred had from not just his colleagues in the media but from the athletes themselves. Here was the athlete reaching out to a member of the media just to make sure Fred was in the loop. It reminded me of when I asked Fred about how we got the pronunciations of the athletes' names right all the time, since they aren't often easy as something like Walker. Um, and Fred just demonstrated the, the same kind of respect for the athletes uh, by telling me that before a game, he would simply go and ask them, you know, how do you prefer to uh, be, be called uh, in, in, in your own uh, country or, or e even here an anglicized version of it, uh, how, how do you want me to pronounce your name? You'd do this in, in uh, either the pregame interview or even just around the batting cage before, uh, before a game. Um, and that's just a simple example of how much of a professional Fred was. He's somebody who simply cared. So let's lay, raise a glass to Fred, Fred Walker, a true one of a kind, a father, a husband, an uncle, a mentor, a colleague, and so much more, and one we will never forget. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. You do them proud. So next we're going to kind of address what's in a name. My dad was referred to by many a name or nickname over the years. Uh, he was called Shorty when he, play, when he played center for the St. Mary's University basketball team. He was branded the sleepwalker when he hosted the first all night radio uh, show for, as a DJ for CHNS in Halifax. Uh, many knew him as Freddie uh, in the office, on the ball field, on the tennis courts. Um, another common moniker was Uncle Fred, as Greg just explained very clearly to you the impact that Uncle Fred had on anyone that deemed to call him Uncle Fred. I grew up in a culture when you didn't call your parents friends by their first names, you didn't call them by Mr. or Mrs. because they were close family friends. So. I inherited a whole bunch of what I term courtesy cousins, aunts and uncles, and a whole rack of people that referred to my dad as Uncle Fred, even the neighborhood kids. So he, uh, he wore it well, he took pride in being called Uncle Fred and thought of as everybody's Uncle Fred. Um, it was during our recent sharing of memories that I learned of the differences that my courtesy cousins, namely Craig Sterling, experienced in our youth when we went to work with my dad. So um, Craig had the opportunity to go to the Montreal Forum with my dad as uh, on one of the Habs games, and his six-year-old self was beyond, uh, you know, in all of his glory. He thought it was just the best. He's with Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred takes him to the dressing room between periods. And this is in the 70s. So he has, six-year-old Craig has to walk down the gauntlet of all of the chairs outside the dressing room that have all of the French Canadian players smoking chain, chain smoking cigarettes in their full uniforms before he makes it into the dressing room. 
but he is then afforded the opportunity to have a photo with his idol, Ken Dryden. So from there on out, Uncle Fred was the best. That being said, uh, the 70s did not afford the same privileges to Daddy's Little Girl. Um, I did get the privilege of going to the, the Habs games with my dad. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit in the CBC seats, which were in the nosebleeds. I did have the opportunity and privilege to go to the press box and see him in his finest hour. But I gotta tell you, a young girl with visually challenged Coke bottle bottom glasses, the, the, the view of the ice is fantastic, but it's freaking far away. So, you know, I was not that impressed. I was impressed by the work he did, but I was like, can't we get better seats somewhere? We never got better seats. Um, nevertheless, those were the moments that my dad shared his passion with hockey with me and basically turned me into the lifelong Habs fan that I've now become. Um, when dad married Wendy, it brought a whole new wonderful extended family, uh, as well as many more cousins by marriage and also additional courtesy cousins. We have a eulogy that has been shared with us by one of my courtesy cousins that I have not had the pleasure to meet just yet, but I very much look forward to it. His name is Simon Jackson. He's the son of Wendy's oldest and dearest friends, Carol Ann, and I'd like to share with you his words. Simon writes, all loss is sad, but some is disproportionately profound. And for me, the loss of Fred is just that, a profound loss of a kind, steady light in dark times. Fred wasn't my uncle, but he might as well have been. He was the uncle I never really had, family in every sense of the word. I loved Fred, not only for what he meant to Wendy and my family, but for the unwavering kindness he brought to our world. His smile, his joy, and generosity of spirit lightened every mood and every room he entered. In an era when all seem so preoccupied by judging and dividing, Fred did the opposite. As a kid who strived to be taken seriously in an adult world, Fred always made me feel valued, important, and respected. He made me feel as if I was an equal. That meant something to a kid. It means something to me still. When I started university in a new city, Wendy and Fred welcomed me into their home on countless occasions to help me adjust to Toronto a city in no small part thanks to them that became my home of my heart. When together, Fred seemed to know that I needed a reprieve from talking about my work and always indulged me in talk that was a calm in a storm, like sports. It was a gift in hard times. As life got more hectic, seeing Fred was always a welcome joy, a time to be cherished and to look forward to. In fact, at my wedding, I spent a disproportionate part of my evening talking with Fred about the future of R.A. Dickey in the Blue Jays rotation. We weighed the possible sale of Dickey's house and that if it might be a good sign that the dreadful pitcher was on the way out. It was silly and irrelevant and ever so perfect amidst a night of pomp and circumstance, and it brings a smile to my face to this day. Indeed, Fred always brought a smile to my face, and when thinking of him, he always will, which, when you think about it, is an incredible gift. Even though our collective tears roll today, the happiness he brought to our lives will continue to thrive in our hearts and minds always. Fred might just have been the most genuinely kind person I've ever known. He was a kind man in an unkind time. Our world is lesser without him. My world is lesser without him and yet we're all better for having known him and by working to embody his spirit of kindness. I know his spirit will live on in each of us each day. The words of Simon Jackson. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask uh, a friend and former colleague of my dad's to join us, Mr. George Young, if you wouldn't mind uh, coming and sharing a few words with us. <clears throat> Hi everyone, uh, look around this room and I'm, the biggest challenge I've had here today is to remember what people looked like 25 years ago. <laughs> 
I, I've won, I think, three or four times, and that's about it. It was 1967 that I started with the CBC, and, uh, and uh, I was there 28 years through about 1994. Fred and I were colleagues for radio sports. Uh, when I first started in Halifax, we would hear the reports out of Montreal on syndication uh, from Fred. <clears throat> he was working with Alec Bellini at the time, and um, uh, we would get those on a daily basis. We uh, worked together for the first time, I think it was in 1976, at the uh, Innsbruck Olympics, and then again at the uh, Montreal Olympics. Eventually, we would, would work together in Toronto, uh, probably about 10 years before I took early retirement and about 11 or 12 before Fred did the same. I was told I had to keep everything to five minutes today, so what I've done, I've written down a few things that I wanted to say, and this will be fairly short. And after I have some remarks also from Marilyn uh, Vestergaum, who also worked in our radio sports office. Fred totally enjoyed what he did. He was in his element talking with elite athletes and being a part of that. He had a compassionate way of telling a story, yet at the same time was driven to get the facts for the real story. He liked to challenge, whether that was in getting a story or preparing for assignments at the Olympics or a hockey broadcast. He liked being on that stage and he had a smooth way of telling his story or reporting live or describing an event. Fred and I shared many personal times together. We talked a lot about our families, stuff going on in our lives, experiences that we all had and shared on the road. I will never forget his love for gadgets. It's been referred to already. <laughs> Something new. Uh, he thrived on that, and we thrived on it too, because when we got computers in our office, he was the go-to guy. We all wound up at his desk to discuss what it really all meant. I will remember Fred for his friendship, uh, his professionalism, his compassion, his love for his family, his delight in telling a good story. Fred, you've left your mark in the industry and those around you. I feel blessed that I was part of that circle and would like to thank the family for putting on the celebration of life today. It's been a great time seeing so many of you, uh, if you, that I haven't had contact for many years. So Fred, thank you for bringing us all together today and we can still see your smiling face. That's my comments and now I gotta find Marilyn's. Marilyn wrote this this morning. She said, I had the pleasure of working with Fred first when he was in Montreal and later when he moved to Toronto, contributing to the national radio sports program, The Sound of Sports, and various events like the Canada Summer Games and the Commonwealth Games. Home for the Sound of Sports team was in the attic at 354 Jarvis Street, which meant five flights of stairs. Fred would easily clamber up those stairs two at a time but I would follow close behind, never giving him total victory. <laughs> but his six foot three inch frame was hard to circumnavigate. These past few years, blame it on COVID, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of hindsight thinking. A flood of memories has pushed me to seek out those that touch my life. I wish I had reached out to Fred. He was great at storytelling and his passion for reporting poolside took listeners to the starting blocks alongside our Canadian swimmers as they propelled themselves into the water. Fred understood, oops, Fred understood the importance behind the sound of sports and gave listeners a front row seat to the field of play. Fred was right there, taking each stroke, breath, and kick to the finish. Fred's passing reminds us we need to reconnect, to celebrate and share those stories and memories. I want to thank Fred for being an important part of my life and my career, Marilyn Vestergaard. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this. Okay, I've got one more for you. It's um, a, a dear family friend that I'd like to call to the podium, and after uh, after he's uh, said his few words, uh, we're going to encourage you all to mill about, take a break, 
have some food, have some drink, reconnect, and then we'll have a few more speakers after we have a little pause. But before that, I'd like to welcome Paul Lewis, a dear family friend, to the podium to share his, uh, his thoughts and his memories. How is everyone today? Now I want to see a show of hands for anybody that does this when they go outside, maybe in the morning, afternoon, and you look up at the sky and you look for the sun. Have, have anybody that does that? Sure. Great. Now, the thing about the sun is this. To me, it represents warmth, and that is the essence of Fred. Fred did a lot of great things, but he was always a warm person. Whether we would be talking about carrot cakes, or we'd talk about cheese, we'd talk about beer, we'd just talk about maybe the blade of grass, just general things, you always felt this warmth. And whenever Catherine and myself would visit Fred, we always said we're gonna go see Friendy, because it was Fred and Wendy, and it was Friend. And that was his, I think one of his greatest gifts, the warmth, you could feel it from this man. And he was a, he was a large man, but you could always feel the warmth, like the warmth of the sun. And it's a great thing to be here today. I know we'll miss Fred in our different ways, but always remember the warmth from the sun and think about Fred. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, here, what I'll, I'll do it. I can give you my. You can have my phone if you want. Oh, no, that's okay. I'll just pull I, I, I had it on here. It's a little bit bigger. Do you want a hotspot my phone? No, no, no. I've got my own phone, too. But I've got it on my phone, so I'm good. Okay. I just, I just had a couple of. The Wi Fi is a little uncomfortable here. Yeah. So that's why we got the light. Okay. I can. It's, it's all here and here anyway, so. Right. Yeah. I thought mine was you, and then I was. Yeah, I.
Uh, no, I'm okay. Cause I, was, I can move this out of the way. This so, don't so, in my anxiety, how many more? What? How many more speakers? More.
got a two hour nap and it's going to be I hope everybody is enjoying their snacks and their beverages. I'd like to have you continue to enjoy your beverages and your snacks, but in the interim, while you're doing that, I'm going to call up part of my extended family, Dan and Chris Bennett. Thanks, Christine. And uh, Christine has been a rock helping Wendy out with all of this, and she's, uh, she's the one who helped put this whole thing together. So maybe a, a hand for Christine. <laughs> now, I brought, I brought my little boy along to, to help, um, and, and you know, just in case I, I stumble a little bit. If you ever get asked to do these type of presentations and whatnot, I'll give you two words of advice. The first one is, say, before I start, then that way Christine can't start the five minute clock. You can usually get two to three to four minutes in before the clock actually starts. The other thing that you don't want to do is follow other people because you know, the tears end up on your notes and then you're, you're toast. But anyway, we'll, we'll work our way through it. Um, my son works with facts and figures. He's a lawyer and whatnot. He has to be concerned with facts and figures. I have made a lifetime commitment to not let facts get in the way of a good story. So there will be no coming up and fact checking after I'm done. You are to take the essence of my story and the facts notwithstanding. So, all right, I'm gonna do it. I wasn't gonna do this. Christine's story about uh, being a lifelong Hab fan didn't get any booze, didn't get any reaction in this room. So I, I think I can get away with this. Fred and I at this time of year, being the spring, would trade barbs about our respective city's hockey teams. We're from Vancouver. My barb for Fred this year was going to be, it's a good one, Toronto, the only city in the world where the Leafs fall in the spring. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, you got away with it. Now, Fred's retort would have been to me something along the line of, Dan, keep the faith. One day Vancouver will get an NHL franchise too. <laughs> so I know this is about Fred, a Fred talk, so to speak, but our story starts with Auntie Wendy. Now, if your family doesn't have an Auntie Wendy, I would suggest you go out and get one this week. Because an Auntie Wendy treats a, a niece like a daughter, and Auntie Wendy has the best Christmas Eves ever. And remember Simon who read this? Simon was probably five to six years old, this guy was probably 15 to 16 years old when we had a magical Christmas Eve at Wendy's in Richmond. Also, if Wendy puts on a dinner party for four people, there's food for 14. <laughs> You've been there, hey, okay? The other thing is Wendy was, has always been open, welcoming, gracious, generous, and whatnot. We had a, life was good. And has anybody in here heard of the Keelings? Uh, you've heard of the Keelings, okay. Roger and Heather. Roger, a really good friend and tennis buddy of Fred's, Heather, lifelong friend of Wendy's, decided that when Wendy was on her business, long extended business trips to Toronto, that they would get the two of them together. Now, I don't know what these flower childs were smoking at the time, but you got a six foot, he's seven, he wasn't six foot three, I looked up, six foot seven, CBC sports jock who played basketball as a kid, still played baseball, golfed, and play tennis. Any, any Fred's tennis folks here? Okay, why did you, he play doubles? He could cover the whole bloody court by himself. <laughs> okay. And so they decided that it would be a really good idea to get this six foot seven sports jock um, together with Wendy, <laughs> with Wendy, okay, who didn't. Like, I, I swear until Fred and Wendy got together, she had no idea that the local papers had a sports section in them. <laughs> and I was, wished I was there the day that Fred said to her, yes, Wendy, Wendy, there are really channels on the TV that only have sports on them. <laughs> so 
we thought, um, you know, things, things were pretty good, but the, the, the nice thing about it was, Wendy didn't really like this guy to start out with. She was not enamored with the big guy at all. And she, she compounded that. She really kept our, our, our status quo going. He phoned and he'd invite her out and do all this sort of stuff. And she played hard to get. Like it was, what, years? She, remember, facts don't matter, but it's the, it's, the, it's the emphasis, okay? So she played hard to get until I got a phone call one time. And you got to realize when you get a phone call directly from Wendy, it's serious. Wendy, if it's not important, she would, call, she would go through an intermediary. Uh, have Dan do this, have Dan fix that, have Dan send this. But when Wendy called directly, it was serious stuff. She said to me, Dan, Fred has invited me out to a hockey game, a Maple Leafs game at Maple Leaf Gardens. And of course, we all knew it wasn't a playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I thought, oh, and he thinks this is going to win her over? Boy, is that guy out to lunch. Then Wendy said to me, Dan, I have two serious questions to ask you. I thought, oh, crap, she's going to try to make a good impression. We're going to lose her to the dark side. She said to me, Dan, what is a blue line? <laughs> the second question was, and what's the significance of it? I explained. I don't know that it did much good. But I, it comes as no surprise to anybody in this, this room that it wasn't much longer that this interloper, this Fred Walker character, became Uncle Fred. And you've heard Uncle Fred mentioned before. And, and, and it wasn't that long that he became. But you know what? It was interesting. It wasn't until about two or three weeks ago that I thought to ask myself the question, so what changed her mind? Like, she didn't like this guy to start Well, not like that. Was, she wasn't enamored with him to start with. And she played hard to get. What, what changed it? And uh, the epiphany that came to me was it was a Christmas of 1988 in West Vancouver. Wendy and Fred had come out. They were staying at Wendy's mom's and dad's place. And in a kind of an interesting twist of the Christmas story, there was no room at the house for Sue and me, but there was room at the inn. We stayed at the Hyatt in town. And I didn't know whether I could get away with this or not, but you know why? A 40-something career woman, very successful, really good, uh, very successful 50-something-ish um, broadcaster were assigned separate rooms. So not only did the interloper get Auntie Wendy, he got my damn room. <laughs> <laughs> and it was that, here's where the facts come a, become a little murky, and here's where I must remind you, no fact checkers after I'm done, okay? At some point, Fred pulled out this, this is the very tape recorder. He pulled this tape recorder. Technology's changed a little bit since 1988. And he said to us, would it be okay if I um, played you a tape that I had done with some Canadian sports celebrities? And we would have, it was Gretzky's, and we would have recognized them all at the time. And we said, sure. But partway into the tape, we went, hold it. This is not an interview. This is a really sincere guy who's interested in these folks, these people, as individuals, what makes them tick, and he was genuinely interested. He was just having a conversation with them. And that, as we all know here, that carried over into Fred's personal life, and I honestly think that that's, and I haven't fact-checked this with Wendy, but I think if that, that wasn't one of the major things, she probably saw that side of Fred ahead of us, that genuine individual, that real gentleman, that re and we didn't get a chance to really see that, and I'm pretty sure that that's what uh, turned her. I, I will get corrected later, mind you, but that's what I thought. Now, what's other interesting is our youngest, when I was preparing what I wanted to t talk to you folks about, she was also preparing something that Chris is gonna read, and it's, we, we didn't consult, but it's really interesting. That note that I just finished on is exactly what Kelly's note's all about. So I'll, I'll bring up my little boy and ask him if he'd uh, read a note from younger sister. Oops, okay. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dan's son, Chris. The family asked me to be here today with dad um, because dad's a little shy. <laughs> <laughs> there were some concerns about maybe some awkward silences. 
Uh, and if we're being honest, some awkward old guy jokes. Um, but when my sister Kelly heard that I was going to be here today, she asked if I could read a note that she'd written to Uncle Fred. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, Kelly is the favorite child of the family. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be here today because she was too busy being adored by everyone. Uh, it's very time consuming. Um, so she asked if I would speak for her, and I said, <laughs> yeah, I'll read your note for you, you bet. Um, so I have a note that I'm going to read to you, um, and for authenticity purposes, I'm going to do my best to make it seem as if she is up here reading it to you instead of me. So you might have to close your eyes, I don't know, but I'm going to give it a go. All right, here we go. Like, hello? <laughs> I'm like, Kelly? And I was like, Uncle Fred's favorite. L O L. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, Look, on an unrelated note, um, at this point, what I would like to do is to read um, a, a very heartfelt, moving uh, tribute that I wrote to Uncle Fred. Oh, and Kelly, if you're watching this online, you might want to pay attention because this is how it's supposed to be done. <laughs> it's been said there are two types of people in the world, those who are waiting to talk and those who listen. Well, it's safe to say Uncle Fred was a wonderful listener, and he had a way of making you feel like you were the center of the universe. However, it wasn't until after his passing, as I was reading the amazing, amazing tributes that poured in for him from family, friends, colleagues, and athletes, uh, that I realized it wasn't just me or my kids who had been blessed by his gift of listening. It was a gift he extended to everyone he ever met. The common thread throughout all of the tributes to him was his ability to make people feel heard, understood, and valued. In short, he truly cared about our stories. It didn't matter what passing fancy I was interested in at the time. He listened, remembered, and ran with it. He supported me and later my kiddos with every passion, interest, or curiosity we ever had. For example, he gave me my first tennis racket. He let me tag along with him to work and meet some of the greatest athletes in sport. He gifted Jenea with her first good camera and shared photography tips with her. And he watched endless videos and photos of our swim meets, field hockey matches, and rugby games. He supported every dream or interest that we had, instilling in us the gift of dreaming big and the faith that whatever path or interest we, cho we chose, we had the tools to be great. On the days when doubts would creep in, he was always there in our corner reminding us just how special and capable we were. So, until we meet again, Uncle Fred, I promise to suck every chicken wing clean, put my all into everything I do, and to give the gift of truly listening to everyone, because everyone has a story worth telling. And finally, as my kiddos would say, we love you to the moon and back, Uncle Fred, love, Kelly. I mean, Chris. <laughs> Dad? So, just thanks. You had me, I, he doesn't usually make mistakes, and I thought, what, what's this, he didn't write that. <laughs> anyway, um, Wendy, um, this started with Auntie Wendy, as a, my, or my story, that's where it got started, our story, that's where it got started. Um, thank you for not playing hard to get for too long. Uh, some estimated a year, year and a half, two years, but it was probably less than that, because you brought an absolute gentleman into our lives. I can't, <laughs> and we're all the better for it. And, Going to Auntie Wendy's place was a treat. Going to Auntie Wendy and Uncle Fred's place, ultimate. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to call on John Iovoni to share some words with us. John is a longtime friend 
colleague. Thank you, Christine. Um, we uh, go way back, but before I get into that, I know that aside from family, friends, and work colleagues, uh, Fred would have been really pleased today to know that, that he brought back the Sports Media Canada family, of which he was such a, a devoted uh, contributor for so many years. Uh, we lost uh, our co-founder, Don Goodwin, a few years ago. That was followed by the tenacious Dick Bradbeer. And recently, we've lost Ralph Mellenby and now, of course, Fred Walker. And we're privileged, and I know that Fred would be honored to know today that coming from Niagara region, we have Rosemary Goodwin and Gillian Mellenby, and all the way from Stately Kindergarten, our Sports Media Canada President, Steve McAllister. Um, the last time I spoke to Fred, uh, was shortly after Ralph passed away, and he was talking about two things with great fervor. One was packing up because he had to move from the home to the condominium, and he was looking forward to that chapter in his life. And the other reason was that he was looking forward to us finding a way to revive our Sports Media Canada luncheon this year, which we hope to do. My introduction to Fred came as a teenager when I latched on to his every word during NHL broadcast on CBC Radio with another legendary person in Danny Gallivan. Imagine then, more than five decades ago, when I first met, uh, met Fred in Montreal at the Forum, and instantly discovered that the great voice was also a true gentleman, forever smiling, enthusiastic, encouraging, well respected by his peers in sports media. This celebration of Fred is observance on how he was a towering positive presence, a mentor to many, a friend to all, and a believer in the importance of media. Of all the qualities Fred exuded, the one that most stands out to me is his humility. He covered virtually all the dream sports events and crossed paths with all time great athletes of any era. He showed his deafness in news coverage during the horrors of Munich and then guided us through the inspiration of Terry Fox. Yet never once did Fred boast about his remarkable resume. He regarded himself as the storyteller and not the story. He was overwhelmed and shocked when he was welcomed into the CBC Sports Hall of Fame, as well as receiving the Sports Media Canada Career Achievement Award, insisting others were more deserving. Well, Fred, you earned each and every honor because you were a shining beacon of what our business should be, a real pro. Thanks for everything, Fred, and rest in peace with the knowledge you forever touched our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to call on my husband, Reiner, who is going to share a message that was sent to us by, um, I don't have words for him, friend, former colleague, Mr. Phil Dugas, who was tremendous when the news was out that my dad had passed. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to keep together. Um, Phil and the next lady, who I'm going to ask to join us, Bridget O'Toole, rallied the troops and got the word out and shared our loss collectively and did so much work in communication and putting together memories and stories and sharing and helping us get this organized and get people connected, that there are no words for us to thank you for all of the hard work that you did. And not just Phil, not just Bridget, everybody, Nancy Lee, Mark Thompson, I, I can't name you all, and I just want to make sure that everybody understands that these people were instrumental in the, the good old-fashioned grapevine. So in the interim, I'm going to let Bridget make her way up here, but Reiner is going to share Phil's short novel because Phil, ha <laughs> Phil, has, Phil, Phil has a lot of words to say. Okay, so thank you. I'm, uh, as Christine said, I'm gonna be really uh, reading from um, Phil Dugas, former colleague of Fred's at CBC, his uh, kind words. Um, I'm visiting family in Alberta and really missing being there today but really wanted to share a few thoughts for Wendy and Christine and for all the Walker family, as well as Fred's CBC family and many friends. Fred was just the best. 
That's something we've heard time and time again these past few weeks. The recent outpouring of emotion exchanged among our former colleagues at CDC Radio Sports says it all. We're not simply just former colleagues and friends, but we're actually a big family. Fred was the elder statesman of the CBC Radio Sports family, who we all loved, respected, and looked up to. His accomplishments in broadcasting are incredible, yet people kept telling us about his mentorship, his kindness, his humility. Fred was one of the best in the business, but he was also friendly, approachable, and helpful to all of his colleagues, and he always made time to talk about Wendy and Christine. At the office or on assignment, Fred was a pretty sharp dresser, especially among the often understated fashion of the radio crowd. Always wearing a nice blazer to go with his stylish Hathaway shirt and quite often sporting Florsheim shoes. Yet getting close to fit him was never easy for Fred, as he used to tell us over and over and over <laughs> again. Getting a good parking spot in front of the old Church Street office downtown wasn't easy either. But Fred worked very hard to get the best spots and the best deals. He took his parking craft very seriously. Freddie negotiated a great spot each day from someone on the early morning shift who would be on their way home shortly. Talk about respect. People were actually honored and stood in line to have a chance to give up their parking spots to Fred Rock. <laughs> Outside of the office, you knew about Fred's passion and skill for tennis, but some of you may not know he also, oh, sorry, uh, no, was also, uh, Fred was also a force on the baseball diamond. He played in the CBC Sports League, uh, softball league, but he was also really in a league of his own. To no one's surprise, Fred's team always seemed to win the championship. He had a sweet swing and could hit the ball a mile hitting legendary home runs for his adoring teammates. And just like his smooth delivery uh, behind the microphone, Freddie was the smoothest fielding shortstop in the league. I didn't see him play until he was in his 40s, so imagine how good it must have been in his prime, I used to wonder. We will all remember him in our own way and miss him for countless reasons. The old radio sports family will always share great stories about Fred and his adventures, hold him in the highest regard. I will miss being able to talk to him about the incredible games and the incredible athletes he covered around the country and around the world. I will miss hearing him call out to me, Filippo, in his big, big, booming voice. However, like so many of us, I feel privileged to have heard so many personal stories from Fred about his Hall of Fame career. I was lucky to see him in action in the studio and listen to him deliver a big story from a big event live in the studio as it was going to thousands of CBC radio listeners across the country with a voice and delivery as smooth as ever. You're missed, Freddy, but I know there's a good parking spot in heaven reserved just for you. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> Phil Filippo Duggets. Thank you. So Phil was with us in spirit. Bridget, are you ready? Nothing better than having the CBC gang all wind up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by reading something from a colleague and a friend of ours who was very close to Fred, and that was Dwight Smith. And after I finish this, I have a little story of my own or two to say. So this is from Dwight Smith. A devastating loss, a hell of a man. The best mentor a young guy could have trying to get a full-time gig at CBC. When I applied for Eric Moffat's vacated position in radio sports department back in 1982, Bob Wilson told me I'd done one of the worst interviews he'd ever witnessed. <laughs> Apparently, I gave them all the wrong answers, but good old Fred, bless his soul, told them they better hire him. He's a great guy. Apparently, I just wanted to, apparently Fred just wanted to make sure that this endor endorsement wasn't in vain. Freddie continued to keep an eye on me all over the years and never hesitated to pass on his vast encyclopedic knowledge and cutting edge technology skills. <laughs> Which brings me to my favorite memory involving Fred Walker. In 1988, Alan Clark decided 
I would take over Fred Walker's baseball duties, beginning with the World Series between the LA Dodgers and the Oakland A's. I would accompany Fred to LA for the first games of the series and then head to Oakland on my own. No pressure, right? We arrive at our hotel in LA and our rooms have modular phones that can't be taken apart. So how are we going to send our reports back? This is, of course, before we all had cell phones. No problem, says Fred, and he takes out his portable tool bag and proceeds to hack into the phone's outlet and we got our gear connected and sent on our reports. First lesson learned. But that was nothing compared to what he did the next day at the ballpark. Game one of the 1988 World Series had become legendary for Kirk Gibson's winning home off Dennis Eckerly after Gibson hobbled around Hope Plate on two bad knees, seemingly with little chance of making a difference in this game. Nobody could have predicted the dramatic events that transpired that day, but Fred was ready. To set the scene, we're sitting not in the press box, but in the grandstand among the fans. There is a payphone not too far away where Fred will file a short game summary before we head off to do post-game interviews. As Gibson's historic blast is heaving the stadium, Fred turns to me and said, Smitty, you go and guard that payphone booth right now. Let nobody in. Less than a minute later, the crowd still screaming at their delight, Fred sprints to the phone booth, calls home, and does something I will never forget. Fred had just a few words on a scrap of paper, and he draws a complete analogy between Gibson's feet and the epic home run hit by Robert Redford's character, Roy Hobbs, in the movie, The Natural. You know, the guy's all washed up and winds up the hero. And Fred did it in one take, 40 seconds, spot on, with the crowd still going nuts behind. Hangs up the phone and turns to me with that megawatt smile and says, no sweat, Smitty, no sweat. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No sweat? Wow, I had just witnessed one of the most amazing performances under pressure. It also scared the hell out of me because I suddenly realized how high the bar has been set for my own work. From that day forward, I strive to reach that bar, but it was no contest. Fred Walker was a unique talent, never to be matched. I am immensely enriched to have known him, and as I write this for you all today, a Blue Jays spring training game is being broadcast in the background. Go figure. Sincerely, Dwight Smith. And I would also like to add some thoughts of my own. I was very, very lucky and privileged for years to have worked with Fred all over the world, from World Junior hockey games, um, world hockey games, baseball games, um, Olympics, and I was so happy to have somebody who was calm, cool, collected, and always in a good mood, even though I wasn't from time to time, <laughs> right? But he always was. I remember this one time, and Alan, you'll remember, before the 88 Olympics, it was decided that myself and Fred and Doug Culture, and I think it was Todd Faraci, would um, go across the whole country broadcasting all of Dave King's hockey games to every small little place there was in Canada. So this was fine. Um, oh, the other thing, Fred was a great driver. So driving with Fred, he had everything under control. So we're at, I think it was either Sudbury or Sault Ste. Marie, and we're very quickly getting ready to broadcast the game. And so we're doing a quick check, and Fred's going, and they're going down, he's going into the net, he scores! But I don't know who it is, Bridget, because there's a flag hanging right <laughs> over the goal. <laughs> so I quickly sprinted three press rows, three press rooms down, but you know, not being six foot seven, I couldn't reach the flag. <laughs> so Fred came back down and got the flag down so we could actually do play-by-play -play on the whole game. <laughs> There's one other thing I would like to mention, and this goes to Fred's generosity. Um, at one point, my son Rory, who's at the back here, 
um, was doing a project on the Munich Olympics. And I happened to say, you know, Fred was at the Munich Olympics. And where he said, do you think Fred would talk to me? And I said, I'm sure he would. I called him up and Wendy and Fred very generously invited him several times to their house. And if I remember correctly, I think Rory got a pretty good mark on his essay on the Munich Olympics. <laughs> um, I really want to thank Wendy and Christine for putting this on to enable all of us to share. And we've had a wonderful time doing this. Thank you all very much. We have an extra special treat this afternoon. A friend, Kelly Sloan, who has been an invaluable support to both my dad and Wendy in the last few months, helping them get organized as they were planning to consider relocating and downsizing their house. Uh, so it, Kelly's a girl of many talents, and today she's going to perform for us. So it, I'd like to invite Kelly to come up and uh, honor us with her, her musical talent. So um, I feel very, very blessed. Um, for the last six months or so, um, I have been working at their house, at Christian said, um, going through a lifetime of memories and in equal parts uh, Christmas decorations. Um, <laughs> and um, it's been not work at all. And it was a joy to show up every day. Um, I love organizing, so that was a plus. And then with going through everything, <clears throat> I got all these stories, which were incredibly an extraordinary life. Um, and then uh, at lunchtime, uh, Wendy would send me into the den with Fred. We could talk uh, golf and music and stuff while she made us perfect sandwiches that we would share. So I don't know what kind of job that is, but um, it certainly didn't feel like work. Um, and I'm very, very honored that Wendy um, shared some of those precious hours of her Fred with me, and I will take those hours for, for the rest of my life. Um, thank you very much. So, one thing I learned, um, Fred loved uh, John Denver, um, which is really great because uh, that was one of the 10 CDs my mom got from Columbia House. Um, so I, I actually know uh, John Denver's stuff, and uh, despite it being my mom's choice, I secretly enjoyed it. Don't tell her. Um, so I found a, uh, a song that uh, John Denver sang with some of his friends, and um, I thought it had a really nice message. So um, I hope Fred likes it. He's too nice to have said it otherwise, so. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Perhaps love is like a missing place, sheltered from the storm. It exists to bring you comfort. It's there to keep you warm. And in those times of trouble, Some way of living, to some a way to feel. 
Thank you, Kelly. That was beautiful, and my dad would have loved it. I'd like to invite my Aunt Judy up, who has a few words to share with us. She's really an aunt. This is Greg's mom. <laughs> I want to thank Kelly for reducing me to tears before I get up here. <laughs> I really like John Denver, too. Well, I have a few things I'd like to address. Um, Christine said um, five minutes, so I'll do my best here. I, um, I've sort of been introduced. My son, who spoke first, um, Gregory, um, I was brother-in-law, or Fred was my brother-in-law. And I was married to his uh, brother, John, who was the father of my children, Greg, and my daughter, Susan, who couldn't be here today. Uh, her husband is fighting his own cancer. Greg, my son, only left out one comment, as far as I can think. When Uncle Fred phoned him and he wanted some help, he'd say, Greggy, come and help me. <laughs> There's only two people in the world that can call my son Greggy, and that's me, his mother, and Uncle Fred. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Where are you, dear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mine are early memories. You've already mentioned that Fred began work very early as a teenager as a DJ in Halifax at CHNS Radio Nova Scotia on the night shift, playing music, fielding requests all night long for people on duty, which is probably how he came to know his first wife, Diane, which is Christine's mum. She was a nursing student at Victoria General Hospital in Halifax in the class of 1963. The nurses weren't beyond phoning in at night and making a request to songs like, well, we'll play the House of the Rising Sun and dedicate it to the other hospital, the Catholic nurses at the infirmary. It was lots of fun, the different songs they would choose. Fred became known at that time to just about all that nursing class of 63A, and we hear again that refrain about him Everybody loved him, especially that whole nursing class loved him. He would do anything to help. He would drive them. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. I'm not supposed to do that. <sighs> I really lost it. He would drive them, he would move furniture, he would deliver a pizza, he would do anything. But I wanted to acknowledge that because this today, because there are two nurses here today from that class. Alvira Clark and Ethel Cook, and they too loved Fred. Give a wave, they're over there. <laughs> they live in Ontario now. 
Second thing, at the height of six foot six or six foot seven, I've heard different measurements today, of course Shorty Walker was the inevitable nickname. The thing about Fred's height was when you received a hug from Fred, you pretty much ended up jammed into his belt buckle. <laughs> Hang on to your glasses. Not short on height, Fred also was not short on words. He loved to tell stories. He had an amazing laugh and a pick-you-up sense of humor, which has been quoted before. Third thing, in those early years, Fred lived by the water near the Armdale Rotary in Halifax, its own nightmare to drive. Have any of you ever driven the Armdale Rotary in Halifax? There you go, you survived. It's even worse now. Anyway, that was out near Chocolate Lake. Years later, after he moved to Montreal and then Ontario, his parents moved to the southeast shore beyond Halifax to Ship Harbor, on a hill, overlooking the ocean of lovely, frigid Atlantic waters. His mum, Grace, loved it there. It had a long, long, and I mean long hill, a walk down to the sea, where the tide would ebb and flow every day. His mother loved that wilderness and that wretched uphill walk from that portion of the water. The rest of us, the climb wore us out. Fred was the only one that could accomplish it with ease. And so I found these words in a poem I wanted to share today, which is why I drew your attention to the vastness and power of the sea and the rhythm of the ocean. And it goes like this. <clears throat> the tide recedes, but leaves behind bright seashells on the sand. The sun goes down, but gentle warmth still lingers on the land. The music stops, and yet it echoes on in sweet refrain. For every joy that passes, something beautiful remains. Fred was our joy, a beautiful soul who spread his music with laughter and intensity, and his love and caring remains now and always with us. It is his gift to all of us. It is said that our dying is our last great adventure, Fred loved adventure, new ideas, and discovering. And so today we commend him to his eternal rest within the realm of all that is holy and good. As we bless him today, we remember the blessing he has been to us. And so, Fred Walker, may you rest in peace in God's goodness and light. And we are grateful beyond words. Wendy, I would like you and Christine, if you would, to just come forward and stand beside me here. Bring any friend you need to hold you up. Of course I'm going to make you cry. <laughs> I want to thank Wendy and the, the love of his life, and Christine, his magnificent daughter, two beautiful women, who in their grief have worked exhaustingly to welcome us to this celebration. You honor us in sharing your love, your tears, your stories, and your beloved Fred and your beloved dad. There was no one like Fred Walker. And so we all thank you. And that, friends, is our amen. So be it. If you want to raise a glass of wine, water, coffee, coke, or your hand in the air. The wine of heaven is a beautiful place. God bless you and thank you. Here. Thanks, Judy. Thank to you. Fred. to try. I'd like to thank all of you for coming, for being here in person or for those of us who are watching through live stream. You honor Fred and with your, sh the sharing of your stories and all, your, all the memories that you have shared with him it means so very much to both Chris and me. And I'd personally like to thank you all for the love, care, and support that you have shown to me over the last difficult months. 
my friend was a very special man. <laughs> he was my love, my rock, and my very best friend. We had 34 wonderful, wonderful years together, and those memories will be with me always and forever. To our, to all our family members and close friends who wanted to be here with us today and couldn't, they range from the East Coast to the West Coast and wanted to come. I know you're watching, but I want you to know that I truly believe that friend knows that you're here and are with him in spirit. But most importantly, I want to say a very, very special thank you to Christine, who has become not only one of my dearest friends, but she is the daughter that Fred has shared with me over all those years. Without her, this afternoon could never have happened, and I don't think I would have made it through the last two months without her. Chris, your dad would be, he loved you so much and he would be so very, very proud of you. I love you and I am so thankful to have you in my life. Thank you everybody for being here. I was doing pretty good at keeping it together. <laughs> I have this portfolio. I still have, I could keep you here all night with messages and stories that people have shared, but I'm not going to because I know you need to intermingle and everything. So just in closing, I'm gonna share just my last words with you. My dad was my own personal superhero. Following kind of in my Aunt Judy's footsteps here and I didn't know what she was gonna say, um, he was my lighthouse and beacon in a storm. During difficult times in my life, he was always that calming and loving presence. No matter how difficult things could get, he was my haven. Although we spent a lot of our, a lot of our lives in different cities, he was always with me. I received postcards and phone calls from all over the globe. He celebrated my every achievement and I always knew he was my, that I was his pride and joy. He was kind, loving, and always generous with his time, unless he was watching or listening to a baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> then he kind of came in second fiddle. I could, I, I, I could always tell. I, I'd call him, and if the game was on, you couldn't hear it in the background, but all of a sudden there would be these pauses and silence in the conversation. <laughs> And uh, my dad was never short for words, so invariably when I challenged him on it, I then got the play-by-play -play of what just happened <laughs> on the James game. So um, one of my dad's best decisions was asking Wendy to marry him. Although Wendy would not be what you called a sports enthusiast, as Dan had so eloquently pointed out, um, she embraced that part of my dad's life she tolerated the endless Blue Jays games because dad figured out a way to mute the volume and Wendy could still share the same space and not listen to the endless hours of baseball. Um, with Wendy, he not only gained a wife and extended family, but a partner, friend, and advocate. Although my dad had medical issues the majority of his life commencing in his 30s, he was generally responsible about his health, but with Wendy by his side, he lived a full and loving life. It is my sincere belief that between his positive attitude and Wendy's unconditional love, we all got a lot more time with him walking this earth. So dad, rest in peace, and before I bid you adieu, I'd like to thank Victoria Fleming, the Credit Valley Golf Club for sharing their space with us today, and most importantly, all of you for sharing your memories, your stories, supporting us, being here. And it's so 
my dad would be delighted. Oh my God, he would be working this room. <laughs> I mean, going from table to table, nonchalantly sitting down. Hey, I got a story for you. So, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.